And that's what we're going to investigate today. What is the significance of the frying pan here on the Cape Fear and even in New York City? So we'll see about that. Now, um, yeah, okay. Let's define the area from whence this name derived, okay? The frying pan shows are a long, shifting area down here. You can, bear, can you see where I outlined it in green? Uh -huh. Okay, all right. Um, so this, this map, um, well, backing up. We're going to define the area where the frying pan shoals are. Uh, and that's a long, shifting area of sand and uh, uh, pebbles and a sandbar. It's not a big rock formation like I did think for a long time and maybe others of you have thought about it just being rocks going out there off of Bald Head Island. Um, but it is, it's like a gravel bar many times and it's also made up of silt that comes from uh, the river or from the ocean and a lot of times it does have, um, uh, of course it does have sand and sometimes these small pebbles. The first mention of the name Cape Fear uh, or frying pan shows comes with um, Abram Collett's 1770 map, which we see over there. And uh, it looks like a long handle of a frying pan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of where the name came from. And the, the pan itself being Bald Head Island, or uh, really the <coughs> legal name of Smith Island, that became popularly known as bald head. Now, the, the shoals or this uh, handle uh, goes out 28 miles into the Atlantic Ocean from Bald Head Island. So that's quite a distance for uh, this long, and we'll just call it sandbar or the shoals. And um, they have, uh, of course, been a hazard to ships. Um, uh, in this area, beginning with the European fellows who came over here in the 1500s. The first um, European that we had to come into the Cape Fear River uh, or into the, the harbor down here at the end of Howe Street was um, Verrazano uh, in 1524. Uh, and by the way, I found him in Italy. Um, he's in, he came from Tuscany originally. Um, anyway, um, this is also why uh, oh, and also, you can see the little red dot up there, that's us, that's Southport, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Tiny, and the yellow line is, is the uh, river coming down from uh, Wilmington, the Cape Fear River, and there's Southport on that side, of course, Bald Head over here, and then the shoals are the handle of the frying pan. Now, um, the uh, whole coast of North Carolina is called the graveyard of the Atlantic. And the reason for that is because all of these little things here are shipwrecks. Uh, and the presence of these shoals, when they got down here to, this is us down here around the blue circle, um, was if they came in, oh, we're going to go in here, if they tried to come over right at the end of Bald Head, they were going to hit the shoals or those sandbars and that is the reason that we have had river pilots here in uh, Smithville, Southport for 300 years almost is to go out here in the ocean before one of those ships became one of these little notations that it was shipwrecked to bring them over the shoals, right tide, right place, everything to get them into the harbor. Uh, the Cape Fear. By the way, the Cape Fear River is the only river in North Carolina that di that empties directly into the Atlantic Ocean. All of the other rivers in our state either empty into the Cape Fear or other bigger rivers, and then those rivers empty into larger bodies of, of water like the Pamlico Sound and uh, some of those that are further up north around the um, Outer Banks, but the Cape Fear is our only big river, only river that comes in to the Atlantic Ocean right here, uh, just beyond Caswell, uh, just beyond um, Bald Head Island. By the way, the river that comes in behind Oak Island is not the Cape Fear. 
That's the Elizabeth River, and the Elizabeth meets the Cape Fear right at Southport, right downtown at the pier and uh, the waterfront. Those two rivers, the Elizabeth coming from Oak Island, and the Cape Fear, the big mighty river coming from Wilmington, Fayetteville, 200 miles up into the state, up around um, Pittsburgh, up in that area. So when it gets here, because the Cape Fear is bigger, it takes over the Elizabeth, poor little Elizabeth, and then out it goes to the Atlantic Ocean. And those shoals are there 28 miles out. Uh, so those pilots had to bring in uh, these ships for all these years. And it was also used by the Civil War uh, blockade runners who were pilots here in Smithville at that time, um, who deliberately set out for the shoals when they were leaving to go to uh, pick up supplies for the Confederacy up in Wilmington, uh, one of the strongholds there. Um, they had to um, get around those big blockade ships that um, the President, President Lincoln, had sent down here to keep the Confederacy under control. Um, anyway, and they would come, uh, they could come across the shoals at the right time because they knew that the shoals were there for one thing, and then they also had shallow uh, boats, uh, steam powered boats. Whereas these big hulking blockaders were sitting out there, huge ships, kind of like not really like the container ships we see going up and down the river now, but somewhere on that line. But anyway, then they would go uh, around and head up the river and leave the big ships outside uh, of the area there. And so that was one of the ways we kept the Confederacy uh, or the Confederate States uh, alive for as long as we did. But that's another talk. Okay, so between 1994, this is in our lifetime, uh, and 2008, the last uh, update I had here, uh, over 130 new shipwrecks were discovered and located along um, the, um, the coast of North Carolina. Someone has said that our coast looks like a jigsaw puzzle that hasn't quite gotten finished up because we have all of these barrier islands such as Bald Head and Oak Island and others. Well, let's also see about lighthouses because um, aren't they supposed to tell ships when you're getting close to land? Well, yes, they do. But if you're getting close to an underground or underwater sandbar or some uh, treacherous thing like that, then the lighthouse is probably not going to do you much good. But let's talk about uh, these warning lights that we uh, have around here. In 1854, because of complaints from mariners um, that the height of the existing Bald Head uh, Lighthouse, which is this one over here, the first one, um, was inadequate and the light was not bright enough uh, to warn of the shallow waters or about frying pan shoals because it was on Bald Head Island. The shoals were 28 uh, miles further out. So um, the, the first light ship was stationed on the shoals and uh, in lieu of trying to improve that lighthouse so that it would do a better job. Uh, and that, uh, a little history about the lighthouses, in 1793 the federal government uh, contra uh, contracted to build the Bald Head Lighthouse at a cost of $11,300 and um, they imported nearly 60,000 bricks from Philadelphia and also some uh, the wrought iron lanterns that held the light, they were up at the top and it was completed in December of 1794, so that was a long way back for well, that first lighthouse that you see over there with the um, lighthouse keeper's cottage. Now, because of beach erosion, in 1813 the lighthouse was torn down, the first one, and the federal government began accepting bids to build another uh, lighthouse in, uh, on Old Baldy. So they built this one. Uh, and in 1816, they uh, built this uh, octagon shape um, old body here, 110 feet walls, uh, uh, 
and from the original bricks from the original lighthouse, that one over there, plus some newly pressed bricks were used to build the second uh, bald head lighthouse. And so on April the 1st of 1817, this lighthouse was completed. But that's not all. Uh, another skeleton lighthouse uh, was constructed of iron in 1903. So now we're jumping up almost a century to when this iron one was built. And that was on the southern tip of um, Bald Head Island, which is closer to um, Oak Island. And it was demolished uh, and um, replaced with the Oak Island Lighthouse um, in 1958. So the, uh, this one has been there since 58, and it replaced uh, that one there. Um, so let's get back to light ships um, instead of lighthouses. The first U.S. light ship was a small wooden schooner um, that uh, was moored on the Chesapeake Bay up in Virginia uh, in 1820. And from this pioneer, the light ship developed through the 19th century and from sail to steam, it first started out as a, a sailboat, uh, then to steam, and then uh, from being made of wood to being made of iron, and then to having steel hulls, which uh, they finished up, and also to make the lights more powerful uh, as it progressed. Um, the total number around the coast in our country uh, it was in 1909, that's when they used the most light ships, and that was 168 uh, were constructed by the United States Lighthouse Service, and six of those um, uh, were also built by the United States Coast Guard. Now the Coast Guard absorbed the Lighthouse Service in 1939, so we don't have the U.S. Lighthouse Service uh, or Light Ship Service any longer. In, um, in 1854, a wooden hull uh, was first uh, assigned to the frying pan shoals. And it had two lights, 40 feet above um, the uh, water level. And it was uh, stationed there on the shoals until it was taken to Fort Caswell by the Union, the Yankee forces, <laughs> and burned on the last day of December 1861, just at, almost at the beginning of the Civil War. They took our wooden light ship off the shoals and took it over to Fort Castle, set fire to it. So that was the end of that one. You'll hear as we go along that the frying pan uh, light ship had nine lives because there were not nine different boats that uh, were uh, on station um, at the end of those 28 miles out to sea. That reminds me of a song. 26 miles across the sea. Santa Catalina is awaiting for me. I used to be able to look out my living room window and see that. Oh, I did when we lived in California when Jerry was in prison out there. So, but I always think about that with the 28 miles. The Navy sent another light ship after they burned that one, but it was taken by the Confederates in, and sunk in, in uh, the bay out there. In, in 1864, mainly to provide an obstruction uh, for the Union blockaders and other ships that were trying to get into the Cape Fear. They thought, okay, we'll just take the light ship and bring it up here and sink it, and that'll keep uh, some ships from coming in. And that was during the last days of our year of the Civil War. Um, and also during that time, the government sent another light ship out to uh, Frying Pan Shoals, and uh, this was the first one that had frying pan written on the side of it. Um, officially designated by numbers after 1867, after the Civil War was over, they started not only naming these vessels, and they were usually named by the place where they were on service, which made ours frying pan because they were at the frying pan shows, <coughs> but they also came up with a numbering system for them and our light ship number was 115, number 115. Um, the total number, as I said earlier, uh, around the coast was 168 of these light ships. Mm -hmm. Now, in um, 18, uh, 
1999, uh, or actually the first man, up until this point there were no people, no workers on the light ships. They were serviced by a boat who would come by and do whatever needed to be done, like keeping the lights lit. lit. Uh, but the first manned light ship was authorized by Congress in 1819, and uh, in 1920 um, it was built and um, put on uh, the, the, its light stations. So many vessels uh, at this time were lit by lamps that ranged anywhere from pans of oil with wicks floating in them um, to lamps that were set on platforms. Uh, on the, on the uh, poles that were, or the mast, uh, and suspended there. And these lights were not visible too far out to sea because you probably know that fire, when you see it at first, it looks big and, and light, but then the further away you get from it, the dimmer it gets. So um, these wooden light ships um, had a lifespan of about five to ten years because of the decay of the wood and with them being in the ocean uh, all the time or in the water all the time. But there were a few that lasted as long as 50 years. Um, keeping, up the, keeping the light lit was uh, one of the most crucial parts, of course, of a light ship. It uh, wouldn't be in use to have one if, it, if the light didn't work. And it had to be tall enough and bright enough so that it wouldn't be confused with other marker lights that might be in the area or with other ship lights um, that might be around. So early light ships had all powered light, uh, lamps and the crews had to maintain these constantly. And in this slide we're seeing this group of men who are working on one of the uh, uh, lights there that they're going to hoist up on the mast where they're standing and the other one uh, are where they are and they're going to be able to move that all the way up to the top of that mast. But as time progressed, so did the way that the lights were powered. They were really no longer, um, it was not uh, good just to go and light the fire and, and hope that it stood up there. So technology comes along and the lights have progressed and they went from simple oil lamps um, to, that were maintained by these fellows who came and went off of the uh, uh, ships. And then by the late 1820s, they had the um, Fresnel lens that was invented. And that was what you see in the picture up here, where there are lens uh, and the fire is burning, uh, or the oil is burning inside of that. And these were jumbo sized um, lens that would reflect the light and therefore make them much uh, brighter. And um, some of the light ships had two lights on them, as we uh, will see on our ship, and that uh, was either they would burn them both at the same time or they would keep one in reserve in case uh, the, the first one failed for some reason. Um, the first composite or iron hulled uh, light ship uh, the first two were revenue cutters that uh, had been active during the Mexican War, 1847. But the next uh, iron light ship, and we're going from wood to iron now, was a former Confederate gunboat uh, called the Lady Davis. Uh, she was first built in 1858 prior to the Civil War. And she had a, a lifetime as a tugboat, the um, James Gray, uh, in... Um, uh, her earlier life in Charleston. And then following um, the fall of Charleston, uh, she was acquired and re-equipped to be used as a light ship at Port Royal uh, down near Charleston. And how did they keep her in the water and from floating around? They put eight tons of old cannon shells from Charleston after the war was over in the hull or uh, underneath as ballast. Uh, to keep them deeper in the water. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what was going on in Charleston in building light ships. Um, our light ship, number 115, was built um, in uh, between 1829, excuse me, 1929 and 1930 by the Charleston Dry Dock 
um, and machine company and it was delivered to the shoals out here on April the 8th in 1930. Um, in addition to the light, it also had a very powerful horn and a bell um, equipped also with the radio um, uh, and radio beacon and submarine sig signal bell. All of these new um, equipment things were going on the light ships in 1930. And our ship number 115 was one of six duplicate ships that were built uh, at the uh, uh, Charleston uh, works here uh, during these years of, of uh, 1929 and 1930. What else was going on in our country during those years? The Great Depression. So this was a great source of jobs, especially down in uh, the Charleston uh, area there. Uh, the fellow that you see up there is James Ramsey, and he had been uh, appointed to see to the construction of these six light ships. And um, uh, number 115, 116, 117, 18, and 19. Uh, so they um, built the ships there. This is a picture of number 116, uh, which is the Chesapeake um, light ship. Um, and then this is also when they first uh, started with it, with the beams and all, and then as they're progressing, exactly like the frying pan, exactly, because all of these six that were built at that time in Charleston were exactly alike. So when we look at that one, we're also looking at ours. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, the number of light ships that stood uh, guard here at frying pan uh, throughout the years, and the ninth of these, this hours is uh, this one that was built at this time was the last um, one that we um, we got, and it was 133 feet in length. I asked my husband this morning how long our house was, and he says about 150 feet. So imagine your house or a typical brick ranch house about being that long. And her two beacons were located 65 feet high. Usually a story in a building is about 10 to 12 feet, right? Go like this, yes. <laughs> okay. And so let's just say about six stories high was how high the lights were. The beams were uh, up up, uh, above the, um, the ship. And she carried two 7,000 pound anchors. And I'll show you a little more about those in a minute. Um, now, if you've got two seven, excuse me, not seven thousand, yeah, seven thousand pound um, anchors, that means you've got fourteen thousand pounds on your ship that are anchors mm -hmm. until they're thrown in the water and then they're not on your ship anymore. You, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so the coast, uh, the cost of um, a building um, our ship, the frying pan, and these others that they were building there, was seven hundred and ninety-one thousand dollars. That was back in nineteen twenty-nine. A lot of money that the government was spending on uh, light ships being built, and, um, and then it was decommissioned by the Coast Guard in nineteen sixty-four. So it lasted a long time. Um, next, we're going to see a little bit about um, the ships that they were normally pla uh, painted a bright red. Uh, and the, they displayed the name of the station where they were assigned uh, in white uppercase letters. All of them looked the same here. They, they were painted red, uh, except for one or two maybe exceptions, and they all had the same type of lettering on. There was no fancy doings and all that sort of thing because that was the standard um, that uh, they had to stick to. Now, um, and that made them visible uh, a long way off. And also, um, that, as I said, that was the standard. Relief was written on the ones uh, that were usually retired ones or ones that weren't on real active duty anymore. And they were used while the regular ship was being serviced at the dry dock uh, or being taken in. Normally, they would um, be um, out for... Um, a year at a time and then they would take them in 
uh, to service and maintain them, uh, and then a relief um, light uh, boat would come out and take its place until it was ready to come back. This is a model of the frying pan um, that's down at the um, um, Maritime Museum. I'm not <coughs> sure. Does anybody know who? I want to say Lou Hardy, but I'm not sure. I don't know. No, it's, it's no longer in the Maritime it's Museum. It's not there? Where is it's it? It's in the Fort Johnston Museum. Okay. All right. so go across the street to the, to the city museum at Fort Johnston, and you will see this one. Of course, we can get a better idea of what it looked like um, with, the, with the two masts, 65 feet up in the air, the lights up there, the smokestack, and... Uh, the um, life-saving boat, and so on and so forth. So you might want to, uh, out of curiosity, to go and take a look at that. This is the anchor, and this is called a mushroom anchor. Have you ever heard of that before? I had never, and so a couple of you guys have. And this is because it looked like a mushroom. Um, and these were designed to sink uh, into the sand and get sucked in, or have sand get sucked in the bowl part of the mushroom there. And that would make it even more stable. It would hold it to the bottom of the ocean uh, better that way. And the frying pan had two of these. Uh, so uh, 1,400 uh, or 14,000 pounds of, of uh, these mushroom anchors on the ship. Um, the uh, picture that we have here is one that the Coast Guard made of our frying pan in 1949, uh, when she was, of course, still on uh, active duty uh, out at the uh, at the shoals, and um, the uh, it had a now had a diesel electric engine, and as I said earlier, the electric powered lights that were uh, generate had generators that kept them going, and um, they. Also, as I said, serve this frying pan was on station at the shoals for 34 years uh, before it was decommissioned by the Coast Guard. Now, what happened after the 34 years and the frying pan was no longer there? Well, this happened. This is uh, what's called a Texas Tower because it resembles um, the uh, towers that are in Texas and Louisiana and other places that do oil drill drilling. Um, these platforms are, so this was outfitted uh, as a light tower. And see the light up there. And it was set on the end of frying pan shoals there. It's still there today. It uh, has other uses other than being a, um, a light because uh, it's, um, not there any longer, and it was manned by a uh, Coast Guard crew at that time. And usually there would be anywhere from two to four um, men on um, a light uh, on a light ship as well as on these towers, and then uh, they would be relieved and come in, have a couple of months off, and then go back again. Um, we have a picture here. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Don't get discouraged by seeing all these that we haven't seen yet. Um, so, uh, when this, uh, the tower was completed, and they were going to use the tower now, uh, the frying pan circled the platform and gave three blasts on its whistle and sailed off to prepare uh, for her new assignment up in Cape May, New Jersey. And she was going to be a relief light ship up there, so they would put relief on her side. Uh, and she served at Cape May for three years as a relief light ship. In 1967, she was given to the city of Southport with the intention of becoming a nautical museum and given temporary berthing positions along the river. There were several places that they birthed it, uh, put it after she came back down from Cape May. She was out at Caswell uh, uh, at the end of uh, Oak Island there for a while. She was uh, also up there where the, the bridge went in, the new bridge, and so on and so forth. So finally, she came down here. Pat, when was that, that it came back to Southport? It came back to Southport in 1967. 
That's when uh, three years after being up in Cape May, uh, after uh, 1964, um, when the platform went up. So um, this um, brings us to um, the frying pan's tumultuous history at the foot of Howe Street, and that's where this picture is made, near Whittler's Bench. And for quite a few years, she listed and bobbled around out there, breaking her moorings more than a few times, uh, requiring rescues by the local tugs who had to get her back in position again. So a light ship commission was formed by the city of Southport to come up with a plan. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like what's going on? It was something we were given, not like a courthouse, to come up with a plan on what to do with this and how to renovate this old girl into a tourist attraction and a museum. So that's the light ship commission that was um, uh, set up by the city to take care of that. Well, look at there. How fancy can you get? That's right down at the end of Howe Street. And um, they got, to, got her in there when she wasn't floating away and breaking her um, mooring. And uh, there were even uh, some uh, volunteers who built this uh, ramp, this platform. It sounds like something that happens around here. Volunteers get busy and make things happen for the city sometime. Um, so a group of volunteers said, okay, we'll build the ramp and the little ticket office there so you can go onto the ship and see the wonderful nautical museum that's going to be on the light, old light ship. What a wonderful plan that failed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After five years, it was still sitting there. It was still not a museum. Um, the, um, it became an eyesore. Um, and a hazard uh, floating around at the end of Powell Street, even though an estimated forty to fifty thousand dollars had been poured into the ship, not counting the volunteer work up there, um, and many hours of, of, of the volunteer man manpower, there seemed to be no hope that the museum would come together, and it didn't. Even though they tried, it was never opened as a museum. By the way, it looked like it was. A museum, but it was not. Uh, even came up with some marketing for it. This brochure uh, was put together. That's a very pleasant picture. A couple of folks sitting there looking at the beautiful frying pan down at the end of the house street there. <clears throat> and uh, they wanted people to come here, of course, as tourists uh, to see the light ship. And here was the inside of the brochure or the back side of it. Telling all about uh, the his or telling some of the statistics and a little bit about it, and inside there was two pages inside all about the history of the, of it. and this big sign was down there in front of the, um, um, what is that? Fort Johnston, <laughs> the garrison. So it said Southport, home of the frying pan light ship. So that was another big uh, thing that was going on to try to attract people um, to the. Um, to the frying pan. But it was not working. Here are a few things that were going on in the newspaper about this time and some of the uh, uh, things that we, uh, we read in the paper. Uh, May 1973, volunteers constructed a ramp to be used for boarding the frying pan light ship moored at the foot of Howe Street in Southport. Okay, And then May 23rd, 1973, the Frying Pan Lightship Commission was promising to have the vessel open for the 4th of July, <laughs> August after the 4th of July, 1973. Congressman Charlie Rose promised the Frying Pan Lightship Commission help in its restoration project so they could open a museum there. And then in October of 1973, um, a six-foot-long alligator was caught in downtown <laughs> Southport, and his picture was taken at the Stateport Pilot Office, and he was turned loose in the Cape Fear River near the Frying Pan Lightship Museum. <laughs> so that's what they were doing with six-foot alligators back in 1973. In January of 74, after months of chipping and painting, 
The frying pan light ship received a bright new coat of red paint um, just in time for the Christmas holidays. Mm -hmm. uh, then in May of 77, now we've gone three more years, uh, a 799 foot cargo ship ran aground at the foot of Howe and Bay Streets mm -hmm. at the site of the Frying Pan Museum, which was not a museum yet, just about 75 yards offshore and had some engine problems, was trying to make this difficult turn to the Cape Fear River and slammed in to the ground there. However, it did not harm the museum and uh, they were uh, able to get it uh, moved away to another place. Um, so while all these things are going on and we're getting reports in the newspaper of what's happening, uh, finally they say that the old and neglected frying pan light ship, didn't put museum this time, uh, unwanted at Southport had become an unwelcome guest at the dock uh, up in Maryland and so it got uh, sold for very little money and taken away and it's saying it may be able to go to New York. And then uh, finally uh, the old light ship did leave uh, and it actually took four years for the city to rid itself of this red painted albatross that was hanging around our necks uh, in the water here and the Coast Guard did not want it back. The city tried to get the Coast Guard to take it back and take it away and they said no. And finally a private um, buyer for probably $10,000 I think or something like that took the ship and took it up to Salisbury, Maryland. Now here's what happened once it got up there. Now, look at this. Is it this miraculous? I can make, we can make the slides jump around. The frying pan was soon abandoned and while she was docked at an old oyster cannery uh, up there in the Chesapeake in Maryland, she event eventually just sank. And these photos were taken when the ship was docked at uh, Wicomico, does anybody know that river, Wicomico River, in this little town called White Heaven, White Heaven, Haven. Is that, is that another, how do you say it? Wicomico. Wicomico. Wicomico, of course that makes a lot more sense. Uh, we was sound it out. Uh, and a little town called White Haven on uh, the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and it had been docked there for roughly 10 years by now. Uh, with little maintenance until this tragic day and it just so happened that somebody was there with a camera when they saw this happening and took these snapshots which now through technology we are able to make it look like we've seen uh, like it was a video or something but these are individual shots um, and she was submerged in this state what she looked like there uh, for three years underwater before it was raised and removed from this site. And uh, when that happened, um, she looked pretty pitiful. Um, and they brought it up and they were ready to scrap it, to sell it for um, the, what was on it. And one of the light uh, masts, you see now it only has one, um, was ripped off while they were trying to bring her up uh, out of the water. But they did clean it up, uh, they refitted it with a new engine and some new equipment and they painted it red again and then guess where it went? It was off to New York City and in 1989 it sailed into the Hudson River in New York City and here we have pictures of the tug giving her a shove and uh, a um, a, a light ship buff had bought it from the folks down there in Maryland and was fixing up and he had a big idea about what to do with this and uh, he made that come true. And so this is where she is today after more renovation. The frying pan began to enjoy the high life uh, as a nightclub and special events venue. Uh, and she is docked at Pier 66 at 26th Street and uh, 12th Avenue in Manhattan, New York. So next time you're up there, go down to the frying pan, have a drink or two, get yourself some good food, 
and enjoy it being there instead of here. <laughs> Even though when you go down to some of our bars that we have down there in the yacht basin now, you can almost get the feel of you might be sitting on the old frying pan there. But if you go inside where it is now, you're going to see uh, what they've done wow. to the frying pan. The old girl, um, in, uh, in 2012 I was in New York City and my granddaughter and I um, went on um, the frying pan. Um, we first saw it when we were on a harbor cruise and I said, oh, there's the frying pan, we got to figure out how to get there. It was June and there were some graduation parties going on and it was in full swing with music and food and drink from, from the bow to the stern. Uh, these are not my pictures, these are uh, internet pictures here of what it looks like on board. Um, but um, it didn't quite look this glamorous that day that I was on it. It had more of a rustic look. I think in uh, since uh, 2012 when I was there, good year, goodness, 10 years ago now, um, that they have jazzed it up quite a bit, which is these are more current mm -hmm. and contemporary pictures that we see here. And um, so, anyway, I really enjoyed being on it. Uh, I poked around a little bit, looked through the portholes, touched it, felt it, and um, uh, walking around the decks and looking at it. And I was a little regretful that we still didn't have her, but I was happy that she was alive and happy in the Big Apple. And the old girl now is 92 years old, and uh, she's had a checkered past, but uh, she's still a sight to behold. And um, so we so um, thus ends our uh, talk about the frying pan, and we're back in, back to this uh, nice painting that Thomas did of the old frying pan. So this was her life for most of her years, and now she's enjoying her retirement <laughs> up in uh, New York. So if you can get up there, go see our frying pan. Now I want to clue you in on a, uh, a YouTube video that you might want to take a look at. Go on there and search for the Chesapeake Lightship Tour, and that's in the ba uh, Baltimore Harbor. Have any of you ever been in the Baltimore Harbor on that? Uh, so you've seen the Chesapeake uh, lightship that's up there. And um, remember that this is uh, uh, what our ship looked like, because this is, this is number 116. So when you go, if you go on YouTube and look for this lightship uh, YouTube, there's a tour on there where you, they take you all over the lightship. We were going to try to do it here, but we had a few technical problems um, that we tried to overcome. <laughs> so we're not going to be able to do the, uh, and it's, the time's run out way out. Uh, so um, uh, take a look at that if you would like to see. It's a 12 minute uh, video and it will show you what it looks like inside, tell you how these light ships work. And remember, she is a sister ship to our frying pan, so what you'll be seeing on the Chesapeake is the same way that the frying pan was built. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming today and, and uh, doing whatever we did. Any questions that I might be able to want, There is so much information online about light ships if, you're, if your appetite has been whetted. Yeah, question. Was the light ship manned all the time or just at night when they needed to uh, the lights on? Or? Later, uh, it was manned all the time with crews that would stay on for a certain period of time. And when it was, uh, it was under the auspices of the Coast Guard. And so um, some of the bigger light ships would have as many as 10 or 12 uh, crew members on, on board. And uh, they had a cook, a, a lifeguard. I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> what am I trying to say? Coast Guard, trained cook. They have wonder. It, you can even find the menus online. Really look like good food of what uh, was served on these Coast Guard light um, ships. And um, so, if you've got nothing else to do in life, just go <laughs> look at all this stuff about light ships. It's amazing. And now I know more than I used to know. Yes, do you no. know if the lights were extinguished uh, during World War II? Oh yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I left that out of my notes. Uh, in World War II, because we didn't want any lights uh, on, on the, they, uh, they moved the ship, actually she was gone, uh, up to, um, or out to 
the Panama Canal. Oh, wow. She had um, two, three, four years maybe away from here. Mm -hmm. uh, she was an inspection ship in the Panama Canal. And um, I read about that, but it didn't, it didn't get into my notes for today for some reason. I read so much stuff, I, my head was swimming mm -hmm. with all of this information. But I, I have read where our German U-boat uh, commanders were surprised when they came close to the coast that the cities, they could say, oh, there's Charleston, there's Miami, and they could basically tell where they were because the cities didn't extinguish their lights. Right, and, and see, that was it was as close as we were. I mean, you know, we had the big U-2 U-boat uh, uh, explosion thing uh, history here. Um, here, even in little old Southport, they tried to get people, you know, put black curtains up, don't have yeah. your lights on, because that, but some of the big cities, they just don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but of course, the light ship was gone during those that time. Uh, so, anyway, there's there's the frying pan. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for your help and your patience. <laughs> it was entertaining. <laughs>